You ever think about quitting? It's the combat of life, hammering the snot out of you. Well, stand by, dig in deep, and get ready to get fired up with us. Welcome to the Team Never Quit Podcast, the number one podcast that inspires you to fight on. I'm your host, David Rutt Rutherford, here with Mr. Never Quit himself, Marcus Luttrell. Our mission is to help you embrace the suck of life, to teach you the values of working your ass off, and to interview the most hard-charging people on planet Earth. We know life is hard. It's time for you to suck it up, buttercup, and let us teach you to persevere in every environment imaginable by sharing real-world lessons learned by those who never quit. That's right. It's time, Marcus, for us to help them defeat the well, negative you're insurgency me up, man. in their you're lives. Fire me up. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. Let's roll. Let's roll. Up from a sub 60 feet below, scuba to the surface, now you're ready to go. K-bar grease gun by my side, these are the tools the comet dies by. Left, left, lefty righty, left, 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 keep it in step. P-I-N-K-Y, pinky is kinky and so am I. Marcus, wizard. Why do we allow him to say? We are bringing one of our own on the show, man. <laughs> do you know what that does to me? Does it make you want to sing? Tears down all walls. Uh, I mean, they come crashing down like the walls of Jericho. That's why I sing the way I do. These are my trumpets of destruction. You're filled with the Spirit. I feel the Holy Spirit always in me. That's why I'm on air in my own unique way. But before we get into it, let me just, I, I want to just stop real quick and say to all of our listeners, hoo thank you so much for everything that you have done for us in this show. Without your help, we would not be where we're at, man. We, we would not be at 2.3 million downloads, one of iTunes' top of 2016 just gaining ground every single month and really giving us an opportunity to bring on just incredible people that now just want to come on the show to share with you, to mm -hmm. share their greatest never quit story, to help you, our listener. And, and that's what Marcus and Wizard and I, that's our mission in life, serving you, our listeners, with positive content that enables you to face the combat of life, to kick the negative insurgency square in the mouth, and to have that never quit spirit day in and day out in the fight. So thank you. If you want to know more, if this is the first time you're here, if you want to know more, please go ahead and visit our website at tnqpodcast.com. Go visit the teamneverquit.com website. Man, you, if you want to download us and have us on demand, go to your iTunes app on any of the phones. Have us on demand. You can listen to us morning, noon, or night while you're PT, while you're, can, while you're surf torturing yourself in the, your backyard, getting wet and sandy before work, which I highly recommend. It's at least once a year. Whatever it is, put us on your phone so we can be there to help you in the combat of life. All right, gents. We are bringing on to the show, in my opinion, one of the most exceptional frogmen of the modern era that's out there. Oh, he's impressive. Any thoughts? I never worked with him, man. That's a, that's a huge title to throw around. Yeah, that, that's pretty steep. <laughs> rather lofty. <laughs> oh. You got one or two, two, three guys talking about a, about a guy. I mean, we're a small community, a bunch of alphas. You got five, ten dudes saying something. There's something to it. Oh, and all of good our, or, or or and all of our little, little, you know, groups our, that I'm own. a part of, you know, our little seal groups and all that. Man, his name pops up all the time. And man, when you look at the 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 thread of comments from dudes that have worked with them, dudes oh, that yeah. know, I mean, it's off the chart in terms of support and what we what he's done. I mean, it's really remarkable. So, but you know, before we go any further, well, wizard, mean, you, you, you read out. I mean, you take a spin through his old service record right here. Well, that's what we're going to do. Oh, check Yeah, that's Wizard, right. give everybody a little background on Andy just before we even get into this, I think. Yeah, let's, let's, let's look at this. So we'll start with his career in the teams. Uh, 
Started out team five. He was over there for about five years, roughly. Then he moves on to Dev Group, 300 Combat Missions Plus. After that, he becomes the LPO of, of Buds, at which point then he gets it, puts it in his officer package, goes from, uh, in, from enlisted to E6. becomes lieutenant. <laughs> becomes lieutenant there and goes to team three. So that's the that's the snapshot of his of his career in the teams. Outside of that, though, he has become a licensed pilot uh, with a commercial air transport rating, Gulf Stream citation ratings, all of this. Something around three thousand hours plus in the air. Hey, man, you know what I love about our crew huh. is that if we if the world kind of falls apart, man, and you know we're all going to come together. Oh we're, yeah, we're all find each other, man, and then we're going to go. You know, we'll go steal somebody's G5, and we got a dude who can fly it. <laughs> I, I love two guys, man, because they, I mean, the stuff they teach us and the tricks of the trade that we that we accumulate over the years is just phenomenal, right? Oh, it's off the charts. I mean, rotary to fixed, you you name it, those guys. <laughs> oh, I love it. Man, absolutely right. He's um He has a, a, a corporate consulting firm as well, but one of the most interesting things that he's known for is a bit of charity work. A Not bit. really a bit. A bit, right? right? On his own, he raised over, it was a million dollars, correct? Yes. It's over a million dollars, and he did this by setting two world records in 2015, jumping for 37,000 feet and flies over 18 miles in a wingsuit. So we got horizontal distance, world yeah. record, Vert. and the jump altitude. Jump, height, jump altitude. Yeah. 37 grand, that's, that's up there. That's up there, bro. That's you huge. Can, you can see all this on, on YouTube if you're interested. Just type in Andy Stump and... You're going to find it, right? God, if I didn't hate jumping out of airplanes so damn much, that <laughs> wingsuit looks like a cool thing to do, man. Have you done that? No. No. Like, it does look cool, man. I'm I mean, I'd try it once the just to say it, but I don't want to do it like... I got that. My, my toe is real big. I'll be the guy my toe grabs the side of the mountain. I'll be like... <laughs> <laughs> Just the slightest, the shit out of the right side the of my slightest flick on one branch and yeah, you're, you're a disaster. Kind of, I was going to always get one boot wet in the op. <laughs> That's a big deal to us, right? When it one sucks. sucks. That's the worst thing on the planet. Yeah, right so in the I, beginning, too. I, I know I should never put one of those on. <laughs> Hell, I'd be a toe jumper on a wingsuit out of the plane, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, damn good. Yeah, I'd flare out. You're like a kite. <laughs> yeah. Flare out real quick, man, and that thing grab that back strut. Be dragging my ass oh all the way back God. home. And make sure my suit was American flag, so it looked like they were towing that thing behind us. Totally, of me. You know totally. I mean? Six foot oh. four American flag at thirty-seven thousand yes, feet. Yeah. yeah, just. Anyways, man. so Andy sets these world records. He raises a million dollars for the Navy SEAL Foundation. Uh, probably the most recognizable thing he's done. He's he's done some work in in, in TV. He was involved uh, in a documentary as well. I mean, the guy is just a success in whatever he he undertakes. It seems like. He he is, and and I and everything that I've witnessed and watched him, I've never met the guy yet. That's why I'm super fired up to meet him. He's just got this humble attitude. He he, you know, he just he's very articulate. He can deliver messaging. I you know I watched him on a bunch of the other podcasts. Oh, yeah. he's I heard he's on. one of our smart guys. Oh yeah. Oh, which are few and far between. Apparently, just look at the three. Well, wizard, you're you're in another <laughs> class, but Nerdly. you and me, knuckles. For sure are not. That's why we're the motivators. Because <laughs> that's all we got. Whack. <laughs> so, but the, the cool thing about Andy is, is, you know, that he's, I love him because he's a unifier. He brings people together. He, 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 he says, hey, listen, you just because you're a, an average person, you can do above average things. If you just, if you just put your mind to it, man. And that's, that's the, I think when people think about Navy SEALs, right? And people definitely have this idea of SEALs and the mindset, mostly because of the training and what we got to go through and their perception of how difficult and arduous it is. When you can see somebody that can replicate that outside of the very protected operations that, you know, we try as best we can to you know, uh, keep classified, but you see somebody emulate them as Andy is now and, and how he holds himself out there in the public eye. It really speaks volumes to what our community is and what it should be. And, and, and just speaks volumes of the, the character that makes up the, 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 the real meat and potatoes of our community. So it's, a, it's just awesome. Mm-hmm. I remember growing up and you hear the stories about maybe a Navy SEAL in the other town or something like that. And you know, you usually think the jocks, right? The, right. the, the number one quarterback or whatever. And they, they do go, right? 
And then I remember we had a kid in our town and um like what what he's the one that, it's that one you don't think i mean it's like no way right no way it's just that fire has been burning inside mm. of him the whole time but well for whatever reason when you're coming up in school it's just not it's not blossomed yet right that that's what buds does peels all that oh away. it I, just I, strips you yeah. down man it strips you to your core yeah. check please and okay. that's what the beauty of the program is right oh sure. you walk in there and you've got these I believe at, at 18 to 25, whatever the average is, you've got this very limited life perspective. Now, some people obviously have more than others, but even as a young person, your, your, your understanding of the greater context of, of how you play a role in history is, is, is kind of narrow. That's it's kinda, beyond you at that point. Right? It's so far generally, beyond Generally, generally. I, yeah. I don't know any dudes, even the guys that I knew were – you know, exceptional and really highly intelligent, they still, you can't wrap your mind around what's going to happen to you. The perspective that you get uh, through life is because of time. It, and experience, experience, right? Yeah. That, that's, those work together. It's hard to get, I mean, a lot, a lot of experience in a short amount of time. No, it's impossible. Yeah, usually when it gets rammed in that hard, something gets missed, right? <laughs> and when it does happen that way, you, you, you know, the time afterwards is when you kind of feel everything. It, totally. Get the feeling. And I mean, dude, I, I was a, a 225-pound, long hair hippie college dropout. I didn't know squat, dude. And I hit those Coronado, and it was like hyperdrive of the reset button, right? And that was the beautiful aspect of it, I think. And what, you know, what I love about it is the, the process involved and how the evolution happens in these small little doses, but, but the growth you get to when then you are moving on with your life post career, really the boundaries are limitless of what you accomplish. And I think Annie Stump is a guy that's, you know, doing that. He's showing the world that, Hey, there are no boundaries. If you've got a good, strong foundation. I mean, you can, you look through that. That's another cool thing about being older and having gone through, when you look back, you can actually look at somebody's, courses of study and what they've been through in the teens man no that's um, each one it's the fire hose effect i mean you hear that word and what that in that phrase you don't have any idea what no. that means. you're like oh I, yeah i can take some stuff man let's do this come on and it's oh. unbelievable i'll never get taking 18 delta right uh, you come in friday afternoon and then like hey you got a 382 uh medical terminology exam on monday on monday monday morning that's and we're a, gonna finish ap next week in a week <laughs> and shock is two weeks i mean th th this is semesters right for, for college students and that test is not, it's all greek right i mean it's a different language dude i have, didn't know what i was and doing you have to know what they mean yeah. you just have to know the word right and i was like man i'm on I, this i'm not made a bad decision trying to do this <laughs> somehow corona yeah, yeah, seems so I cool know, right, man i couldn't say anything i had to suck it up undesignated oh. semen <laughs> Undesignated semen. You know what that means? It's just the nastiest. <laughs> we were the lowest of the low. Not even that, right? <laughs> not even <laughs> that. Not even that. And just, we're just scooping it. Oh, dude. Band-Aid Motrin. What's up? Well, what do you think, man? I think we got to get this guy on. One of the Brotherhood is here with us. Man, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's get Annie stuff on. Dude, every time that we get another brother on the show, in particular, a brother of another mother that's been in the cold, that's been freezing, that has that has been at the combat training tank under the decon showers, it makes my blood boil with excitement, Marcus. Hey, mother. Remember what they tell us? The Pacific Ocean is the womb we come from and the womb we return to. She's our mother that we're reborn from. Dude, that sounds pretty profound. I never, I don't remember Senior Chief with any kind of like poetic sense. He just oh, called remember, us remember a bunch that, of remember, idiots in the in the water. Remember silent option when the instructor was like, <laughs> the student was like, "What are you looking for?" He's like, "I'm looking for a war." Oh, oh, check. Changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> was it that cool? I don't remember it being that cool. And you were, I don't know. I'm, I'm not from Boca. It was pretty damn cool, dude. <laughs> Why do you got a bust Bingo. on where I'm from, Texas? That's so lame, dude. Because anyways, we have one of our own <laughs> kind of on the that? show, man. 
I, I, Andy, it, it is such an honor to have you on. Uh, just watching you over the last few years and your selfless acts and what you did with Navy SEAL Foundation, what you're doing for people around the country and how you're helping people. And it's just, it, it's such an honor to have you on to share with our listeners your wisdom, your thoughts, your mindset, man. So welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, you need less caffeine if that's your <laughs> show. Like you need to, you need to throttle that one back to about. A Andy, it's it's all a, an illusion, right? I was always the positive guy, yeah. so I could distract on how horrible I shot, uh, <laughs> how much I complained. Yeah. Well, that was horseshit. No, <laughs> I, I've, I've seen you. Like I've seen you with morning. a pistol. That, that that's not true. Yeah, no. <laughs> Not even close. What, what's crazy? Here's the craziest one. He keeps saying to me, dude, I was with him in 18 Delta. Like, we're buddies, man. And, and then I, I'm, the, time, Mark, the only time you and I have met is when we played paintball. Oh, that's right. At Bird's birthday party. Party. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. We put an yeah. ass whooping on. The, how awesome was I that? shot your ass. You were hiding behind a <laughs> rock and I blamed you and shot the shit out of you. Right. <laughs> the team got to take me out in front of a bunch of Hollywood uh, A-listers. You know, I remember him saying, Berg's sitting there talking. I can hear him. He's like, what should we do? And Marcus lifts his head up. He's like, oh, it's Andy. We're fucked. <laughs> yeah. the best one was when at the end they were like hey let's get all the seals against us and they put all these rules on us i mean this impossible deal dude and we cut through that through them in what a minute and a half and they, they were, shot, they they were shot right in the head yeah all like headshots that, no, that was part of the deal <laughs> all headshots. wait they asked for headshots no we told them we were going to do that too that's kind of our plan so we had to go down snatch this kid and bring it back to ours there must have been 15 or 20 of them and then there were six six of us right and through the whole day, they had us divided uh, onto the actors' teams, and then at the end, they wanted to go against us. And we had to—they set up, and we had to infill and, and t extract right. that kid, man. A minute and a half. We blew through them so damn fast, killed every one of them with headshots. I remember I was screaming at uh, <laughs> David Dakota. I was like, "The company, I'm coming yeah. for you!" <laughs> I remember he walked out of the building and just started shooting. Mm -hmm. He just walked. He just did like a full on like forward <clears throat> march and just got lit up. But that was his tactic. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Obviously, they're a little bit weird coming from their background, but. Dude, Ari, Ari was there, and he had this uh, leather jacket on. Apparently, it was really, really expensive. And, man, we just lit his ass up <laughs> all through that jacket. Man, he was so pissed. I'm like, dude, man. I you knew what you were getting into, right? That was awesome. That birthday party was awesome. Man, I, I never got to go to any parties like that anymore, dude. Mm, man. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, well, obviously, you're always ready for great, solid answers, but for our, we got to get you, everybody warmed up, all right? So what we do to loosen up our gray matter, to, to, to stretch out our brains a bit, is, is we do the Mad Minute. Now, we are going to fire some really funny questions at you, <laughs> and, and, and we want we to get see what your answers are. So are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm ready, but let's give it a go. All right, I saw a cup of coffee, so you're, you'll be there within two or three. All right, Marcus, fire away. Favorite superhero? <sighs> Superman. Nice, thank you. Thank you. I mean, he flies. Come on. He does fly. Mm. From the wing suit, man, obviously. All mm. right, wizard, go. That's right. All right, should a hearse carrying a corpse be allowed to drive in the carpool lane, yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Next. I mean, that's not even a question. There's two people in the car. Two people in the car. Dude, Larry, team three, <laughs> and Nick, team five, used to put a dummy oh, yeah, in the passenger yeah. going over <laughs> the bridge, bridge. <laughs> in the Coronado. Yeah. Some people getting pulled over for that and had a mannequin, a medical mannequin. A medical mannequin, yeah. <laughs> Cap on top of it. Uh, totally. uh, 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 eight point cover. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Right away, right? Put them in camis, whole nine yards. Oh, put, that's put a metal so awesome. That's in chest too. All right. If you were going to get in fight with one, who would it be? Would it be Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger? I'd say both at the same time. Nice, dude. Nobody's ever said that. Why? Because you could just run around in circles, and they're going to exhaust themselves, and you can kick the shit out of them. <laughs> they are old now, aren't they? They are. <laughs> <laughs> and they, like, I'm thinking they're cardio base and like they're muscle strong, but I don't know if they're street strong. No, I, I think you're right. Mm. I think I think you're there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try one random word association. It's gonna be three words. We haven't tried this before. Just give the absolute first thing that comes to your mind. Sure. Number one, Cobra Commander. 
G.I. Joe. Two, Trailer Park Luxury. Coors Light. <laughs> He's on fire. <laughs> Number three, Cultural Appropriation. Oh, man. Tacos? Nice. Nice. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Nice. That was We could awesome. not do that with everyone, but no, he killed it. He, yeah. he totally awesome. slayed that one. Right. What's something you do when no one's looking? Something I do when no one's looking. I would have to say, like, check myself out in the mirror, see how I'm looking that day. What's good rule one number too, one? Man. That's a good one, too. <laughs> well, gotta look good, man. Gotta look good. You gotta look good. I think we all check ourselves out in the mirror. I just don't think most people will talk about it. But yeah, like, you're walking down the street, and you're going by a department store, you're like, damn, how am I looking today? Oh, shit, I just got caught. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's when, hey, hey, when someone bu busts you, that's when you look real hard. You're like, <laughs> I thought I saw somebody dying in there. And then yeah. Somebody's no, following me. My, my wife will bust me and she'll be like, what are you doing? It's like, nothing. <laughs> Let's just keep walking. I love it. I'm yeah. answering your question. What can I say? Yeah, busted. All right, all right. If you could pick any person in history to get hammered with, who would it be and where would it be? Man, any person in history. I'm going to go with Hitler. <laughs> That's uh, fascinating. And it would be when he was about 18 years old, we could do it in Germany. Uh, to get him hammered and then just choke him to death. Because I think uh, <laughs> and they know, kill him. the consequences, and it, would, it would be impactful. Mm -hmm. Oh, dude. I, oh, it I, certainly would be dude, that. Dude, I've been watching a, a documentary on World War II, and last night the stretch I was in <laughs> with the Holocaust, and I don't mean to go net dark right now, but it, it was substantial. I, I like that answer, man. I like It's a decoy. You're gonna, you're palling up to them. Maybe talk a little mind comp. Really? Do some slide art with them. Slide him a few drinks and then just choke him out while looking into his eyes and just, you know, <laughs> change the course of history. That would be awesome. <laughs> well, the, the, the alcohol part's the best. I'm, uh, my dad always said, hey, man, during like for interrogations, the stuff we do is like, man, you want to get information out of somebody, get them drunk. Because if they don't like you, they're going to tell you about it. And if they like you, they're going to tell everything about it. So just sit there, yeah. get hammered with him, wait for him to spill it out, and then. That's yeah. probably we ha yeah. why we have so many issues in the teams. We don't have any issues <laughs> in the teams, do we? <laughs> Too much honesty at the bar. There's a correlation. It might not be causal, but there's certainly a correlation between alcohol and the problem or a version of problems in the SEAL teams. For Thank sure. you. Thank you for the support on that one. All right, Wizard, go for it. All right. Given the option, would you allow yourself to be cloned in order to harvest the organs and live an additional 100 healthy years? However, that would be taking the life of technically another human being. That's tough. My, my brain hurts from listening to that. I'm going to say no. Uh, just because I think if you get to a position where life no longer becomes finite, and it starts becoming, you know, in your head, it starts becoming more infinite. You have less mm -hmm. value to it. So I think there's something to be said for waking up and knowing that you have a limited amount of time to jam everything in that you want to do. Fascinating. Marcus? Great answer. Uh, if money were no object, what would be the first thing you'd do? One more time? If I was a metal object? <laughs> I already know that No, one. let's have that one. <laughs> <laughs> if money were no object, what would be the first thing you'd do? Take care of my family. You know, pass it out as far as I could to ensure that my family was taken care of. You know, just to reduce stress in their life and then continue that on forward. All right, since you're on a roll with really profound answers right oh, shit, now, we're, we're going to keep going. And all right, if you, this is the last question for the Mad Minute. If you could be president for one day and make a really big decision, what would it be? Outlaw political correctness. Wow. That'd be cool. <laughs> and safe spaces, which are kind of one and of the same. But those are the two things I would get rid of immediately. I love it. Yeah, that I has love some it. far-reaching consequences. Yeah, they do. Well, well, listen, that's the mad minute. I, I, I expected that you would have as many great answers as you did. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, all right. So, Andy, the reason why people come to our podcast is is they're looking for some help. They're looking to hear something, some some pearls of wisdom, or some experience that can provoke that fire in their gut that that can enable them to 
start really facing adversity to overcome those obstacles and and really be able to develop that never quit mindset. So if you could, if you'd be willing, man, would you please share your greatest never quit story or stories with our listeners? Yeah, you know, it, I thought a lot about, you know, you guys hit me about a week ago, you know, and, and kind of gave me the, the wave tops of what we were going to be talking about. And since then, I you know I've been like searching back through the Rolodex of my mind, trying to, you know, catalog or find a story that I think best defines the never quit mentality or attitude. And the realization that I actually came to is that I can't think of one concrete like beacon in the night example from my life that was highlighted by, you know, that moment of never quitting. The, the realization that I came to is that my life is comprised of micro decisions that cool. embody the never quit mentality that got me to, to where I am today. I mean, I could easily go back and talk about a bunch of micro decisions that had a macro impact on my life. But I think, and, and I think that most people live their life that way. Um, you know, there's, I consider my upbringing to be super average. I mean, I'm a public school kid who had a GPA of about 2.6. Nice. Well done. Yeah. Well, I wasn't paying attention. I wanted to be a tea guy and I didn't want to take the SATs because I thought that my friends who were studying for those and worried about college applications were going down the wrong path. You know, in hindsight, I probably should have done that because I didn't know the injury rate at Buds. <laughs> but, you know, but I was an average athlete, you know, so straight up average across the board. I got into the teams very young, uh, into Buds very young. And I can't think of a watershed moment in Buds where it was like the light switch clicked on for me. Again, it was all these micro things every day that led up to one day. You know, the first day I'm standing there giving a hoo to your class. And six months later, you know, class 218 is there giving a hoo to my class. And I can't cool. think of any one moment where it flipped for me. And then even into the SEAL teams, you know, I've served on the East and West Coast teams, uh, did deployments to both theaters of war. And at the end of it, the conclusion that I came to, the long-winded answer to your question that I'm coming to is that I've determined that my life is basically a game of inches. And I oh, think wow. most people's life is a game of inches. And if you can get the momentum rolling, the decisions that you need to make and the ability to put yourself into that mindset of never quitting, they become easier. It's when you roll the ball a little bit and then you stop it because of something that causes a hitch in your giddy up. You know, maybe you have a relationship issue with your spouse, or maybe you have something at work that you're not expecting and you get ambushed with and it and it stops that momentum. That small decision to to quit in that moment, you know, it, it stops the ball from rolling. But I mean I, again I look back at my at Buds as an example and I got to go back as an instructor and I got to spend a ton of time with the students that quit, which was very interesting to me because as you guys all know, when you're going through training, when somebody mm. quits, they just vaporize. Fascinating. Yeah. It's like, go away. where did Bob go? Bob was just having lunch with us. Bob's gone. Uh, <laughs> why did Bob quit? You never, you never get the answer to that question, right? Because you're driving forward because you're in your own journey, in your own mind, in your own struggle trying to make it through. Well, as an instructor, that kid hangs out for a week sometimes or a month or six months. And so I kept talking to him. And, and again, I, I, every time I bring this up, I'm honest. I wasn't talking to them because I was trying to be nice. I was talking to them because I wanted to be able to make more students quit. So I needed to understand why they were quitting so I could use them. <laughs> <All right, so. laughs> Team guy. I'm just, I'm just being honest. And what I found time and time again is the main reason that people quit is they became overwhelmed with the task at hand. They would think about buds in a six-month balloon and that's all they could think about and then they would get really cold or really tired and they would think in their head i can't make it feeling like this for the next six months and they would quit and then they would spend the rest of their life regretting that decision that they made in a trough an emotional trough hmm. and as we all know buds is designed to drive you into a physical and emotional trough and to challenge you and then basically sit back and watch what you do and right. I would boil buds down to we're looking for people that look uh, that can experience failure, and it goes one of two ways. It's either a stumbling block where they quit, right, or it's motivation. So it either fuels you and fires you, which is what I think failure does to most team guys or struggle in general to most team guys, or 
you don't have the aptitude or haven't learned the skills yet to to take that and do something productive with it, so you quit. And in buds, I mean, I'm sure you guys have all heard this too. It's it's you know think about it one day at a time. You know, instead of thinking about it six months, you think about it. it Today is Monday, and I want to see the sun go down at the end of the day. And then when it comes to Hell Week, it's think about it one meal at a time. And it's just this constant reinforcement of it's inches, not miles. The the inches will they'll develop into miles over time. But if all you can think about is I have to end up 180 miles down the road, you're going to trip up along the way. So just put one thing in front of the other. And that's, I mean, literally how, that's how I'm sitting in front of you guys talking to you now. I mean, that was my recipe for being in the SEAL team. Every encounter or every situation that I was ever in, regardless of how painful it was or how uncomfortable it was or even how well it was going, it was just taking that moment that was presenting itself to me and working myself through that to get to the next one. And when things get tough for me in my own head, and I, and I try to reinforce this to my, I have two young boys and a daughter. The daughter's going to be the end of my life. My boys, well, one's going to be a serial <laughs> killer. The other one's probably going to be a poet, but. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it, actually, both of my sons will be serial killers. The difference is one's going to blog about it, and the other one's going to have heads in jars. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really the difference between my boys. But I constantly reinforce to them, you know, when things get difficult, just tell yourself in your head, nothing lasts forever. And just keep moving an inch at a time because eventually you'll get out of hell, whatever you de define hell as. So, I mean, instead of talking about one watershed moment in my life, I think most people, and especially the people listening to your podcast who are looking for things, like you said, like the fire or motivation or something to get them through i think there's more to talk about the general minds than one moment in and of itself so let's do that all right so it, it, i'm glad you opened it up for that because the first thing that really uh came to the forefront of my mind is all right andy that's fine and dandy when you're surrounded by like-minded individuals or pe potential like-minded individuals in 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 ptrr or first phase and that kind of fuels the inch by inch. And in particular, if you gravitate towards an instructor that you feel some sort of connection, I know it's a limited connection, but you, as an instructor, you give a little, you give a little piece every day to suck that kid that might have potential in. I want to backpedal because you didn't show up just turning 18 with that mindset of inch by inch. Now, you had said in other interviews out there that by 11 years old, mm -hmm. you knew you wanted to be a SEAL. I, you've also stated that your father was a Vietnam boat guy. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to and I know this is a long-winded question, but just bear with me. You just said you teach your children, it, this too shall pass. It will end. Did your dad teach you the same thing? And how early did that start? Uh, so the super short answer is yes, uh, but to dig into it a little bit more, uh, I learned most of the lessons. I mean, so my dad was hugely formative in my life. I remember the conversation in the vehicle. His, he had masonry construction company. I worked with him in the summers, and I remember distinctly the drive we were having when the term SEAL was first introduced to me. And people listening to this, I'm sure, will think that knowing what you wanted to do at 11 years old uh, is a little abnormal, but you guys know that it's it's a pretty common narrative inside of the teams that you're surrounded by people that kind of just had that magnetizing force, you know. So the conversation with my dad led to me finding the like the cornerstone book, right? Men with green faces, and this is in the this is in the 80s. So the internet sucked because it was just an idea at that point. So I'm at the library trying to find books, and you can't find that many books. So it was this never-ending quest for knowledge. But even before having a lot of the knowledge that I ended up gaining before going into the military, I, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and I think my dad, my dad realized that. And he, you know, he grew up in a physical job. His, his dad and his dad before him owned construction companies as well. As well. So you know, he grew up doing physical labor surrounded by men in an environment in the modern day might be considered, well, it definitely would be considered not politically correct <laughs> where they're using foul language and they're working really hard and they're working really hard by design. They're not shying away from that. They don't see things that are uncomfortable and avoid it. They just go and they get it done because that's what needs to be done for the day. 
So I think my dad recognized in me early that I was very serious about it. And I mean, I can look back to working with him and for him. Some of the best experiences and lessons in my life, I learned with bricks in my hand. You know, as an example of breaking things up and, you know, this too shall pass and, and the way to set yourself up mentally and emotionally for a task that you know that sucks that you can't accomplish in one moment is when they deliver a pallet of bricks to a job site, which is roughly 500 bricks. And my dad looks at me, and he's like, hey, I need all those on the roof by the end of the day. And, you know, I'm 11 years old and I have a tong of bricks that, that you can pick them up six at a time. So you're taking six bricks off the pallet, onto a ladder, up on the roof, and you have a choice when it comes to viewing that. You can just focus on this massive pile of bricks that seems like it's never going to go away. Or what my dad taught me was, was like, hey, man, instead of thinking about it like that, just pick up six and take them to the roof. And then come back down and pick up six more and think about it as each trip as opposed to the pallet of bricks that's staring you in the face. And before you know it, you're done with that job and you're moving on to the next. And that lesson, you know, that's stuck with me for my entire life. Like I said, life is a game mm -hmm. of inches. That's a, that's a physical representation of a mental position, of thinking about it just incrementally at a time, which completely applies to BUDS, which completely applies to the SEAL teams. It applies to business. It applies to relationships. Like it, it, the applicability of that lesson that I learned by actually physically doing something has stuck with me for my entire life. And I, and I equate those lessons to any level or modicum of success, success that I've been able to achieve. I mean, it, it comes back to those years in my life where I was working physically hard around people that appreciated and respected hard work and mental toughness. That's cool. Marcus, you talk a lot about that too growing up. You and Morgan with your old man and Oh yeah. I mean it's he kind of nailed it the way we were brought up, the the work ethic, right? I mean it's in my books, we were talking about this the other day, and I'm all my books and the teams, it's like work harder than everybody else. That's all I had, right? And that was instilled in me by by my father and his father before him, kind of that's that's the pass down and then the, the, the military option. And I did the same thing, man. Most people see the end game and you can get lost on it. Uh, and uh, you're right, man. When someone quits, they're gone. I mean, they're they're yeah. just gone, and that's by design. I think the instructors well, they, they they're get all the, yeah, they're gone to the class, but they hang out for a long time. Right, they keep some time to like get into their head. And, and as in, there's two worlds in buds. There's the student, right? They need to think small. They need to think inches. My job as an instructor, I need you to think big, and that's all it is. It's a battle of between the ears. Can I get you to think about the big picture? And can you? tune me out and think about the small world, the inches. That's the difference between success and failure at Buds. Right, exactly. I'm focused on the, the push-up I'm doing right now. Not all the push-ups, like the one. Right? I mean, I, <laughs> one I, evolution I, right, at a yeah, time. One, one evolution. order at a time. Yeah, so, some people are like, hey, you know, make it to chow. You can take anything in between chow breaks, right? And, and that's the thing, man. And if you're one of those people who are, yeah, learn how to take the stress and tell yourself, man, that, that I can take this for a few hours and then it's going to settle down. Or even if it goes past that, because the pain that you're in right now is not the pain you're going to be in your entire life. You know, what we what we have to go through in life is what we can take at any given time. And, and the more I mean, the more experience that you have, the more you can take. And you're not in it all the time. So you shouldn't have to think about it like that. I mean, most people get wrapped around the axle about a bad experience and they stay with that their entire, I mean, for weeks or and, and the moment's mm -hmm. gone. I mean, the pain's right. not even there. It's just they keep thinking about it. Man, uh, once that's gone, then the thought of it should be gone. And for whatever reason, if you get tossed back down in there, man, you, you know what that's like. You've been there. Your body will remember it. I mean, it's a body is an awesome mechanism. It's a machine. It wants to stay alive, right? And that pain, you know, it lets you know that. Well, let's, let, go ahead. Let, let yeah. me, I want to just continue while we're here on this, because I have never talked to anybody specifically about getting into the mind of these, well, quitters or dropouts or whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah. Were there any other interesting insights that you can recall that you got from, that you got from them? You know, the biggest thing uh, was how they approach setting their goals. That, that was the, the constantly repeating theme. Some people it was, they realized that physiologically they had enough to meet the minimum standards of whatever phase that they were in, but they didn't mm -hmm. have, the physiological capacity to continue through training. The other one, as we all know, is injury. And like I said before, when I was like, when I was young and I, I had no plan B, I got super lucky because I didn't realize how many people get rolled or hurt or dropped 
uh, from the medical aspect in buds. Right here. <laughs> yeah, but time and time again, you know, it's, I would ask them, you know, why did they quit? And there were, there was, there was two factors. One of them was environmental. They were either cold, you know, mm -hmm. or, and again, that's, and the people who that go to the buds training compound, they expect to see some like school of wizardry where there's all this high <laughs> technology. I'm like, yeah, come on, I'll give you a tour. It's going to take about two minutes. Just the concrete pad that we spray them with hoses, and then they run over there to the ocean, and then we walk them out to the beach. And it's like, cool. That's those that, are our tools. That's it. That's about it. <laughs> and here's our high speed stuff. It's a rubber boat and a telephone pole. Yeah, because I mean, well, here, look, the way you temper steel hasn't changed over any period of time, right? You get it's it really, really hot, really, really cold, and beat the mess out of it. Yeah. These are the tools we use. And that's the environmental piece. So we can make them tired. We can make them cold. We can make them hungry. We can make them wet. All of those things. And then it's how they approach their goals. I mean, that's really, that's really what it can, comes down to being. The, the other successful aspect that I saw that would give people a greater, I guess, statistical chance of graduation was mm -hmm. what type of upbringing they had when they were, you know, when they were in their formative years of their life. Did they work hard or were they sheltered? If they had a job that was physically demanding or they were used to working with their, with their hands, not that that's the only way to work hard, but those people who were used to difficult physical labor, for lack of a better term, did substantially better than those that had things given to them on a silver platter. Mm. And that's really all it was. I mean, at the end of the day, all I tried to do as an instructor to get students to quit, which is part of the job, and every instructor has to go back and they have to work a hell week shift. All I would try to do, the, the, the technique that I would use time and time again that became wickedly effective would just get them to think big. Hey, how long do you think you can be cold like this for? It's Monday, mm. right? It's Sunday night, Monday morning. I'm like, hey, man, it's me and you all week long. And as soon as you could see that seed of doubt in between <laughs> your ears, all you need to do is fertilize it and water it and it grows and it grows and it grows and you see them break because they realize or they think they realize that they cannot do it for such an extended period of time. You've got them to think big. The next thing you hear is the bell going off and I've run into a bunch of students, both ones that graduated and then also ones that have quit. I've had great experiences with both, but I'll talk to the students who quit years later and the, the level of regret that most of them have because of a decision they made in a low point because of how they approach their goal haunts them every single day. I, I'm glad you talked about that. I, on, on my, the podcast I did before this one, I, it used to be a live show and I'd have call in people and I'll never forget. I was, I was finishing up and it was at the end of the show and I had a guy call in and it was a dude that I had gone through buds with. Uh, that was there and he you know he he was like man I rot I remember you you always were fired up you always this and I said well bro you know what what happened he goes well I quit I quit the week before hell week and for 20 years it has haunted me yeah and and I'm like well, well you know meanwhile this is live and I'm like holy cow this guy's about ready to bear his soul but what a profound moment of of insight right well what happened during that time? And he said, well, I was never able to really uh, establish an identity other than the magnitude of that quit. And I said, well, well, is there ever a time where you got something going and kept it going? And he said, no, I could never kickstart my life into those incremental goals for a bigger sense of fulfillment. And I said, well, what are you doing now? And he goes, well, you know, since a, a lot of information has come out about SEALs, there's a lot more inspiring thing. He talked about your book, Marcus. He talked about other things. He said, I finally realize that my identity is not about the bird that's on my chest. It's about how I live my life and the fact that I can get back in the fight and serve whatever that might be. And that's what he was doing. He had changed his life. He was moving across country and he was doing that. So that's a powerful thing that lingers in people's mind. Now, let, to, to shift focus a little bit now, Marcus, you just talked about the, the pain and, and, and how that, you know, you can incrementally get over the pain a little piece at a time. Now, Andy, we, you, it's, it's widely known that at one point in your career, you got shot. 
Can you talk a little bit about how you applied that inch by inch mindset in that recovery as well, too? Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about a, I mean, I don't know if I would call that a watershed moment in my life, but it was certainly a, uh, my life took a three-way off-ramp that I didn't <laughs> see coming, and I had to swerve across hmm. all the lanes and traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, the tail end of that, which I really ended up having to dig myself out of, was, you know, almost a year after that happened, I'm still sitting on the couch with, you know, the matrix pill bottle set, except I had more than, than the green pill and the red pill. I had blue and white and pink and wow. all that stuff, you know? So, and, and that was me putting myself into that situation. You know, that I don't think the military was necessarily prepared early on for the, uh, the onslaught and the type of injuries that, uh, that they were seeing coming back to the U S. So it was a little bit of a prescribe and come back to us when you need more of this, uh, type of environment. Hmm. So I got pretty far down that rabbit hole, and when I made the realization that I needed to start working my way out of it, uh, I mean, I actually, from a physiological perspective, had I just cut cold turkey and tried to swing all the way back to where I was previously without taking that incremental approach, it probably would have been very dangerous. I was on anti-seizure medicine at the time. Oh, wow. Wow that had a secondary or tertiary side effect of neuropathic pain control, which is why I was taking it for the yep. nerve pain. Yep. Mm. But if I had just cut that cold turkey, my resistance to seizures would have basically disappeared. And even though I don't have a medical condition that would allow me to or would make me having seizures, I could have started having them. So not only from a psychological perspective, but from a physiological perspective, I needed to work my way back. And Literally the way that I did it, I remember the day uh, where I took myself back into the gym and I just looked around and I realized the position that I was in and I kind of measured the distance of where I had came from and emotionally told myself like, okay, you know, I'm going to take one step forward today to getting myself back towards that. And I did a ridiculously easy workout. It was basically more stretching and mobility than any type of actual workout, but was covered in sweat probably because I was just starting to sweat out all the narcotics that I was on mm. uh, and slept amazingly well that night for one of the first times in probably, you know, eight to 12 months. I mean, I, I think my wife could still probably point to the, the day on a calendar where that shift happened for me. And then the next day I went in and I tried to do 1% more and then tried to do 1% more the next day. And just, you know, if you take a bunch of time working out, especially for guys, like whatever life will get in the way and, you know, you take a month off and you come back and you're like, all right, I need to go as hard as I can <laughs> and you, you're crushed for a week, right? You're like, you're just absolutely destroyed. So I had been doing nothing for, you know, like six, eight, 10, 12 months. And I was very cognizant of the fact that if I tried to go too hard, too fast, I was going to put myself back in the cellar. And I just focused on trying to sweat every single day. And I put where I had been out of my mind and stop thinking about where it is that I came from and just focused on getting 1% better or 0.01% better or 0.0001% better every single day. And it took about eight months and I'd say I came back probably more capable physically than I had been before. But having one, I changed mm. the training methodology that I was using, but it was that slow incremental taking it one day at a time physically and then physiologically monitoring the meds I was on and weaning myself. I had to take the same approach. Like, okay, I'm going to cut this by one pill this week and then I'll knock another one off next week. It was a combination of both, both psychological and physiological that built together to put me back to, you know, letting me do the things that I was able to do later on in my career. That That's a great, great answer to that. And, and again, I think we're, you're, we're, you're really, being efficient at describing how you collectively join the physical, the mental, the emotional in that incremental change. We had Pat McNamara on uh, mm -hmm. recently, and he talked about training in, in that incremental approach. Um, one of the things I, I, I want to ask you now is, uh, from a bigger perspective, who are the people that you look to to support you in that incremental approach? Because not everybody has that capacity and they don't know how to support in that finite of a space. 
So do you have to coach those people or do you look for people that have that capability? Do you surround yourself with like-minded? Who are the teammates that support you in this this step-by-step approach to life? Yeah, I mean, so that's a broad question. Um, for some people, you might have to do it on your own. I mean, that that's the reality. The community that we came from, we are anomalous in the fact that we were surrounded by people that were extremely similar, uh, that cared about the ones that were around them. And if you reached out to help, you get three times the help that you actually asked for, which is great right. while you're in the military. And as you guys know, at some point in your life, you depart from that and then you become, I hate to say like everybody else, but you, you depart from that community and then you have to find yourself. And, you know, mm-hmm. I know it's crazy to me the number of guys that get out of the military, especially the teams, and they die in their early 40s of heart attacks or suicide, which is, a you know, a problem that we're seeing inside of the SEAL community now. Tragic. So yeah. it is tragic, but it speaks to what happens to people when they lose that base of support. So mm-hmm. if you've never served in the military and you feel like you have to do it or you're forced into this position of doing it on your own, you're not alone because there's plenty of team guys who get out and they detach themselves both physically, they move home or wherever they were from, away from the community that had supported them for a couple of decades, and they also have to figure it out, and they sometimes fail. And I think the biggest thing is, the biggest piece of advice that I could give people is don't be afraid to ask for help. Nice. Uh, you know, it, mm. one of the largest misconceptions I, I see or hear about the SEAL teams often, I call it the unicorn theory. They <laughs> think that the SEAL teams is a, a magical meadow of unicorns with rainbows in the background, and there's like bubblegum rain falling down from the sky, and that everything is perfect, and that's the exact opposite of, of the way it actually is. Like, just like I think we would all say we're very average SEALs, and, and Marcus said it, you know, like hard work was what I had. That's the secret to the SEAL teams. It's a bunch of average people who are working really hard who refuse to give up. Like, we have the same problems that everybody else does. Like, you know, when it comes to the, the mindset of taking it one inch at a time or never quitting, like, I struggle with those things all the time as well, too. It's not a lesson that you learn and then you can just shelve it and expect that you don't have to reinforce it to yourself. Like, there's situations that I encounter in life and I have to constantly remind myself, like, okay, I'm thinking about this too big. I need to bring it back and bring it down and, and I need to make it small. It's something that it, the lesson is great. The constant reinforcement is what is necessary. Whether you're a SEAL or you're an accountant, it's the same theory. You still have to talk to yourself. But if you need help, like go out and ask for help. For me, what really helped me was my, was my family, right? Some people, don't, some people don't have that. And again, reach out to somebody for help. I mean, and that's all I can really say. It's, you can build a bridge by yourself, but it's going to take a really, really long time. And you might live next door to an engineer who could probably help you out with the design as opposed to trying to recreate it on your own. Great answer. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's kind of the way you, every time I would get hurt and have to go down to physical therapy, I still have to do this every year, man. I, I literally start every new job or new adventures like I, like I did when I was going into the SEAL teams, when I started training day one. I mean, I, I know all the experiences I have. I have that with me, and it, yeah, it may give me the ability to shotgun to the end and still, still you know, perform at a proficient level. But, man, I always I like building it base by base, no matter what it is. And that way, you know, if you get hit, they can't take you all the way back down. Yeah, if you don't build it base by base, right, and, and David, you alluded to this, people focus on the shiny object. If you go after the shiny object and you don't take the necessary steps to get to that object, you may actually, you may achieve it, but if anything happens that's unsettling to your plan, you're going to lose it because you don't have the foundation built that's supporting it. Exactly. That's great. That's a great comment. All right, Andy, as, as you've now, you know, made a, a substantial transition, right, and, and you're, you're very well integrated into your post-operational life, you're, but, you know, you still maintain... Uh, affiliations of su- in, in supportive roles in particular. I just want to highlight the effort you made with the Navy SEAL Foundation and raising the money with your world record and the wingsuit jump. And, you know, how do you, because you, you had talked about, all right, now you got to do it on your own. Now there's a, a, a new construct of focus and direction and goal setting. 
how do you establish new goals now in your life? What is what is the, the main criteria that gets Andy Stumpf out of bed every morning? Having a purpose. I want to make a difference. That's the underpinning motivation for the decisions that I make in my life. And I really struggled with that when I got out of the military because the teams provided me that purpose. And I, the litmus test for the things that I do in life now are whether or not I think it can make a difference. I, and that's really all I want to do at the end of the day. And that's why I wanted to do the fundraising for the SEAL Foundation. You know, I left a job where I thought it was very impactful and it was very purpose driven. When I was medically retired, you know, you, you literally and phys physically hang up a uniform in a closet one day and you're still the same person. You just don't have a uniform. And if you derive all of your identity from the uniform or the metal that you wear on your chest, you're going to struggle. Amen. And what I wasn't prepared for was not having a purpose kind of provided for me. So it took me a little bit of time to navigate those waters. And I found it in supporting the guys who are still going overseas. And I do that through supporting the families of the guys who are still going overseas because they are at the end of the day. And this is a realization I didn't really have until – after I got out of the military, I think the easiest position to fill in a military family is the military member because you're focused on your job, you're busy, you're going and doing your work. It's the family that bears the burden and the cost and the pain much more than the military member. So finding that purpose for me was key. And I look at the things that I want to do now and I never wanted to be a public speaker, right? But people keep hitting me up to publicly speak and the only thing my, my rules for public speaking are, I want to never talk about myself. I'll only talk about the amazing people that I was surrounded by and the lessons that I learned because I think those lessons can make a difference. Amen. The, the jumping side of the house, when people hit me up to do projects, if I can tie it into fundraising and that fundraising will make a difference, then, then I'll do it. It's the difference between being a SEAL and being a team guy, right? Mm -hmm. Being a SEAL means you don't really care about the purpose. You just want to wear the trident. Being a team guy can carry with you for your entire life because you're searching for and driving towards purpose, not job title. And the difference between those two is the difference between standing on each side of the Grand Canyon and looking at the gap in between. Like there, there's almost no similarities between a SEAL and a team guy. I, I love that you said that. And, and you actually wrote an amazing piece on that on your blog site called Confessions of an Idiot. And if you're listening, please go and read Andy's stuff. It's powerful, powerful stuff. I, I, I look forward to every time you post something, man, it, 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 as you, as you can imagine being from, you know, being from the brotherhood, of, it hits home too. And it, and it signifies, Hey, that servitude that was so essential, that was so, um, um, igniting in, in how we, lived our everyday lifestyle that seems to fade a little bit when you're not sure where do I apply purpose? What is my purpose? When you can initiate that servitude that says, hey, I'm still a team guy. How can I serve my brother over here? Or how can I serve these kids on this sports team or this company that is struggling or whatever it might be, man, that servitude really inspires that inch by inch mentality. What can you share with the concept of servitude in order for people that are listening that will help them discover what a purpose might be for them? You know, I think it boils down to get over yourself. Uh, one of the things that I, I think one of the most impactful things for me about my time in the military uh, is I came to understand the power of, you know, when you join the military, you surrender some of your constitutionally afforded rights to make sure that other people never have to. And you, you know, wh why do you go to boot camp and get yelled at, right? Because we come from a me, me, me society. And for lack of a better term, they have to start beating that out of you. So instead of thinking about me, you start thinking about we. And I look back at my military service and it was a privilege, right, to wear the uniform of our country. And at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're, we're serving those who work or serving those who live, the citizens of this country. That's our job is to provide space so they can exercise their rights. And in doing so, you learn to look outside of yourself, you know, like just from buds in day one, right? Like stop focusing on yourself and look to the person to the left or right. 
once you make that realization that yes, although you are the one who spends 24 hours a day with yourself and it's very easy to become the center of the known universe or get caught in that trap, getting outside of that and thinking about something that is greater than yourself is to me the first step in finding purpose wow. because your purpose can't be just serving yourself. You might be incredibly rich. You might become incredibly famous. And I know a couple of those people that meet both those criteria. And at the end of the day, I don't know if I would describe them as a very happy person. You know, I've been around enough rich people to totally understand that wealth and happiness are not, you know, always connected. I've seen enough famous people to tell that fame and happiness are also not always connected because I think from what I've seen, both of those two tranches, a lot of the times they lack purpose. They have physical things, but they have nothing deeper than those physical things. And once you serve other people, whether you're forced to do so or you make the, you volunteer to do so, I just think it changes, it changes the way that you think about who you are as a person. Like, you know, my son who just came in, like, it's more important to me to raise him than it is to do things for myself. And that, that's where it all starts. Get out of your way, take a deep breath, take a knee, whatever it is you need to do and realize that you're just a pinprick, you know, on the map that we're living on and your needs and desires are, they're important, but put them aside a little bit and find a way to build up other people around you and stop just focusing on yourself. And, and so look at that in from a business perspective. Imagine that leader who has that mindset, who wants to build up the people who work in that environment, right? He's inspiring people and pulling his people along instead of micromanaging and telling them what to do. The difference in those environments is amazing. And the best SEAL leaders that I ever worked for were those people who got out of their way because it wasn't about them and they wanted to make everybody else around them better. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic advice. It comes up a lot on our show. But when it does, we seem to talk a lot about the low-hanging fruit there. Service to others and we highlight family, we talk about military service, we talk about perhaps charity. Those are very obvious things. But I think for the listener out there, they it's not always that simple. They may not be in a position to go join the military. They may not have family that surrounds them. Maybe they're, they're young, they haven't started their own family, or they don't have a good relationship with their family. Are there other ways that people can find this service that are not in those you know, categories? There totally is. And, but it, again, it comes down to what do you see when you look in the mirror? So I'll give you an example of what I see in the business world. The most common failure I see is people view leadership and position as one and of the same. Right. And job title or the car you drive or what it says in your parking spot. And what they do is they wait until they have that position until they start thinking like a leader. Which is the same thing as waiting until you're 16 years old, having never driven a car, having no understanding of how a car works, going over to your neighbor's house and getting them to take you down to the DMV in a manual transmission vehicle and attempting the driving test. <laughs> if I were to give you that example, though, and say, hey, here's, here's what happened to my son. It's like, I didn't teach him how to drive. He's never been in a car, uh, but he went over you know, to the neighbor, got a manual transmission vehicle, went down to the DMV. He took his test. What do you think happened? Everybody would say, well, he failed miserably. And like, yeah, he did fail miserably unless you know, he had some random anomalous event. Somehow he passed. But when you lay out that scenario and you tell people that the individual failed and you say, are you surprised? They'll say, of course, I'm not surprised. He didn't know how to drive a car. It's a totally unreasonable way to approach driving a vehicle. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. approach leadership, though, in exactly the same way. And they wait until they achieve a leadership position to start thinking like a leader. And if you do that, you're screwed because at best, you're going to be behind the eight ball all the time. So the long-winded way that I'm getting to answer your question of what people can do, and this is the advice that I give every single time I talk in front of leaders of business, is like put all of the business card, the job title stuff, put it in the garbage can. Every single person in the room that I'm in needs to start thinking about themselves as a leader right now. And you need to think about how you want to be as a leader. You need to use examples of people that you've seen that have inspired you. And you need to use examples of people that you've seen that turned you off so you can avoid those behavior. But you have to start thinking about yourself 
as a leader in this moment right now because it changes your it changes your behavior it changes your thought process and even if you never get to a position of leadership based off of job title or business card that's only one type of leadership right that's positional leadership you still have another option in every single second of every day of your life and that's leading by example and if you choose to lead by example you're on the path towards finding a purpose because you realize that everything that you do, there's people that are watching. Yes, you're affecting others around you. Like my son, I have a choice in every single day. I can act like the leader of my family and raise my children, or I can set a bad example and do stupid, selfish things thinking only of myself. It's, but that difference in how I view myself and how I conduct myself is going to have generational effects with my children. So regardless of where you are in your life, Maybe, maybe it's your first day of job at Apple and you work for a terrible boss and you want to be the CEO one day and you're looking at all of the rungs on the ladder that you have to hit on the way up there and you're overwhelmed by that. Okay, don't be overwhelmed by that. Wake up and conduct yourself like the leader that you want to be and maybe your boss is terrible. Show that boss by your example what good leadership looks like. Lead up the chain of command. And think and act and conduct yourself in that manner, and it's life-changing for people. That's the step. Go stand in front of the mirror and ask yourself, uh, am I setting the example or am I looking for the example? Stop looking for the example and start setting it. That was that, tremendous advice. Yeah, that's, that's profound tremendous. for sure. I love that. And, and the, the, the concept that you know, there is right and wrong in this world. There is a, a there, moral ambiguity is, is something that's by choice. And if you choose right, just in and of itself, that becomes a concept of leadership. It becomes a concept, a, a foundation of purpose that ultimately evolves into something bigger and more, more substantial. Mm -hmm. One of the things Marcus Wizard and I talk about frequently is being able to uh, test yourself against the world around you and and being able to uh, look within and that introspection in those hard times. What are some moments that force that out of you, Andy? What are some moments in your life? Because it, it sounds like you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Yeah. How, how do, how, how, what are, can you give us a couple different moments where you're like, er, all right, I need to check myself, really evaluate, do I believe in this? Is, is what I'm doing working? And how do I adjust to, to move the ball or move my sense of purpose one inch forward? Uh, you know, one of the biggest things that I do for myself is I, I seek out failure. Cool. Uh, because people who avoid failure are living in an artificial world. It's, it's not a matter of if you're going to fail, it's a matter of when. And just like buds, you know, we're looking for people who can take failure and use it as motivation as opposed to using it for uh, a stumbling block. So for me, my compass, for lack of a better term, is driven by things that make me uncomfortable or I realize that I'm not good at. And instead of turning my back to those things, I face them head on. And it doesn't mean that I master them. It doesn't mean that... Uh, that I necessarily fail at them. I don't avoid my deficiencies and I try to dive headlong at it to in incrementally increase it 1% until I have a deficiency that's greater than the one that I was attacking. And then I swing towards that one. Uh, you know, for me in my life, I've had that happen with drinking. You know, as a good example for myself personally, like me too. Surprisingly enough, people may not believe this, but there's a culture of drinking in the SEAL teams. No! Pre-9-11, when there was no enemy to fight, so we fought each other. Uh, many Regularly. Of them, yes, often. Those fights would start and they would occur in uh, bars. And I, man, when I was younger in my career, I could drink a ton. And if you don't keep it in check, which I didn't keep it in check, it started creeping itself in. And I started spending more time focusing and thinking about that stuff than I did the, the task at hand of my job, which pre 9-11, that this was an issue I had pre 9-11 because post 9-11, the, the, the glass door of reality kind of got slammed into our face and it recalibrated. But, you know, the realization like, hey, I don't like waking up and feeling like this. I don't like the person that I am when I drink too much. I don't like blacking out and not remembering everything that happened or not having the control of the emotions or of who I am as a person. Mm. 
And instead of ignoring that and continuing to drink, in an A-type environment, saying to the guys like, hey, you know what, I'm good for now. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to back off and being honest about it. I mean, there's an example right there. You know, another one that I think a lot of people struggle with, finances, right? Right. I'm not, by any stretch of the imagination, financially secure, what I would say to be secure. You know, I, I'm, I'm doing fine and I'm navigating my way through, but constantly I see things that I want to have, but I shouldn't. And I say shouldn't because it would have a negative impact on my son or my family or my ability to provide for them. So for me, it's just kind of constantly keeping myself in check and keep coming back to what is my purpose? Like, yes, do I need a Maserati? Of course I need a Maserati, right? But does it help me in my goal and desire of raising kids and providing for them what they need? No, it doesn't. So the litmus test of trying to make a difference, that vehicle doesn't help me make a difference. You no. Know, how about getting my son and spending that money on the monthly payment for a football camp or a lacrosse camp where my yeah. son can get visceral physical experiences and learn the lessons that I was able to learn. Does that fit the goal of purpose? Yes, it does. And making a difference. And it's, it's just, again, like I said, I'm not unique by any stretch. I'm a totally average guy across the board. And a lot of these concepts are very easy to talk about at a wave top conceptual level. They're yeah, hard to live. Absolutely. Those are the tough questions. And it, and it's crazy how, you know, we can be distracted by what society or what other people have or and get lost in the sense of what really means the most to us. And, and that's the perpetual struggle of having purpose, redefining it, you know, refocusing, hitting the wall, moving through it, taking that inch by inch approach. Now, you know, one thing we always like to do and at towards the end of the interview is is we, 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 we like to ask our guests to say, what are the two or three things or, you know, whatever you can surmise that you use every day, right? The, the, the tools of the trade that give you the never quit mindset every day. Is it as simple, simple something as simple as a checklist or is it, you know, much more, you know, uh, grand in terms of you look at the eyes of your child as a driver. What are the things, Andy, that you do every day that our, some of our listeners can employ that keep them going on the never quit mindset? Yeah. yeah so here you go. For me, it's uh, one sweat every day. Uh, it, it took me a while to realize, but I have to get some type of physical release to allow my to give my brain some space to operate. And I find that, especially in the modern era of cell phones and like it's all through digital devices, most people are missing that, that physical release. And for me, it's huge. I just, I think better, I sleep better, my entire day is better. And I usually start off the day by sweating. And sweat, sweat however you need to. Go for a walk, work out really hard, but whatever it is, but start your day off with something that's physical and something that's challenging. Uh, two, I try to do something every day that I don't want to do. And that might be sweating. You know, I don't feel <laughs> like sweating every single day, but you know, I, I definitely just like everybody else can struggle, struggle with procrastination and procrastination can easily just be described as not doing the things that you don't want to do. So we all know things that we need to do or should be done. And I generally go to bed every night, not having accomplished everything that I should, because my list goes on and on and on, but I at least go and I dive headlong and I tackle one of those things. So sweat every day, do something that you don't want to do. And I constantly reinforce to myself, especially when things get challenging or difficult, that nothing lasts forever. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Don't focus on where it is that you actually want to end up being. Just focus on that journey and the step because inches will become miles over time. There's a, like pretty much daily. That's, that's my routine. That, that, that's pretty good right there, man. <laughs> I mean, Same thing, man. Out in that yard, making these hands bleed. It's, yeah. it's, you know, that, that, that line we run every day, all day for years and years and decades, really, man. And when, when that part is, uh, pulled away mentally you may not be thinking about it but physically your body's like hey man we're missing something here <laughs> totally you know, and, and you're right man that um i had a saying when i was in uh, college i joined a fraternity and one of the fraternities were uh, was a uh, if if every delt were like me where would the delts be 
So when I got into the teams, I was like, if, if every team guy were like me, where would the teams be? And then work harder than everybody else. Those are two things I, I wrote down. And, you know, you kind of tell yourself that. And there were days, man, I was like, if every team guy was like me, we'd be in trouble. You know what I'm talking about? We'd, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you know. <laughs> All right, Andy, what's next for you, brother? What's on the horizon? Literally, I know, you're like you said, you're constantly being hit. Your speaking career is, is flourishing. I can't think of a better guy out there to be talking about leadership and the inch-by-inch inch mentality, man. I'm so stoked for you. You've got some other things. But what's really on the horizon for you that you're really going to invest a lot of time and effort and building and, and focus to? Uh, you know, I was having this conversation yesterday, actually, and was, again, kind of just trying to reassess and make sure that the, the compass that I'm following is pointed in the right direction. And I, you know, Mark has asked me, if, if money was no object, you know, what would be the first thing that I would do? And for right now in my life, I'm trying to determine what it is that I want to do using money as not being an object. Like, if I was inherently just crazy wealthy, what would I be doing? So I love skydiving and base jumping, so I definitely would do that. I love the public speaking because I look at it as education. And I realized uh, a couple years ago that I actually really like, I like teaching. I like watching the light bulb come off in people's head. Yeah. And I actually think that the lessons that we had imparted on us in the SEAL teams, it's we are obligated to pass those on to as many people as possible. So Amen. they're not... So they're not lost, and that helps me find a sense of purpose for my old job to drive me forward into what it is that I'm going to be doing. And I have some, uh, you know, consulting. I have a consulting business that, again, on the leadership style of the house, and I would still do that as well because I like the interaction, I like the challenge, I like I like seeing people leave with an ability to make a change in their life. So. The answer is, is that I'm, I'm going to focus on all of those things. Like my near-term goal is I'm uprooting my family and moving into Montana, you know, which is a great move for the family for a variety of reasons. But like on the jumping side of the house, I'm heading out to Utah to go base jumping on Tuesday, you know. So the goal on that is to not die. For, <laughs> it's a good start. You know, to get through next week and not die. And then the rest of the stuff just to keep building it, but keep building it appropriately and for the right reasons with Again, the litmus test of, I just want to make a difference. That's awesome, let's, brother. Let's not forget about, uh, you also have a new podcast, is that correct? We want to mention that. Uh, you know, it's a pretty big deal. I think it's rated like number 15,000 on iTunes. You should look <laughs> it up. It's right at the top of the charts. Well, you just started here. You have you have two episodes. The first one came out on the 11th. One came out on the 19th. What are you, uh, what are you trying to do with, with that podcast? I'm trying to make a difference. You know, you it's, uh, I, it's... I don't think you have a problem like, doing that. No, he's yeah. doing it. That, that's and I actually opened with that on the first one. Like it, most of the things I've done in my life have not been my idea. I don't know if I've ever actually had a unique or original thought. I think <laughs> I just, just my God, that sounds good. I'm going to do that. But I try to be honest about it. Like this was not my idea. So the podcast wasn't my idea. It was from going on other podcasts and people saying, "Hey, like you did. You know, it was great to talk to you. You were able to articulate your points, and then them recommending that I do the same thing." And I don't have a, a goal with it. Like, I'm joking about the iTunes thing. I don't really care where it sits on a rankings, and I have no desire to make money from it. I just I, I feel obligated to take the fortunate lessons that I was surrounded by and amazing examples and a different perspective. I think it's more than anything the difference in perspective because most of the world around me does not make sense. I, I'm, I'm baffled by a lot of human behavior. I'm baffled by the things that people say on social media, by what people say on mainstream media. And, and I don't agree with a lot of it, and I don't want to argue with people, so I'd rather sit down with people who I think are interesting and have a conversation and interject, hopefully, a different set of sunglasses that people can put on and maybe look at the world. Like, that's it. I just, I just want to make or try to make a difference. But, that, again, falls right into it. I love it, Very man, cool. and, I, and I love the hat you're wearing right now. You're wearing Cameron's Keep Hammering hat. We, yeah, he's we, awesome. It, Cameron, oh we had him on, time, one man. of the greatest <laughs> dudes I've ever met. It was so awesome having him on. Yeah. Well, Andy, listen, bro, I, I just, from a, a, you know, not just being a team guy, but being an outsider, this is my first time meeting you and chatting with you. Man, you, you are doing that. You are making a difference. Um, 
uh, you know, just going back and listening to a lot of the different podcasts you've been on and just, you know, you're, you are articulate and you are, you do deliver positive reinforcement for people to become better, to discover that purpose. So I think you're on the right path. I think that purpose will evolve. You're going to get there an inch at a time. And it is just such a privilege and an honor uh, for you to come on with us in the Team Never Quit podcast, brother. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's been uh, it's amazing how fast the time can fly. Absolutely. God dang. No, man, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. Uh, God dang, brother. My pleasure. Take care, Good brother. Good talking to you. God um, bless you. See you. That dude makes me want to do more. He's <laughs> just a massive overachiever. It's incredible. Hey. My, my brother's the same way. Teams, listed officer. He said he was an average athlete across it, it the board, right? It kills me, yeah. You know what happens when, when, when the, the average, those of us that are average and then below average, when you, <laughs> when you try hard enough and get your claws sunk into something that above average people do and get a taste of it, man, it it's a taste that you can't explain, man. I think... Man, to see you ever see something they talk about buds about how bad it sucks, but then man, you're just damn happy to be there. Right. You know that that kind of thing, man. And then you get that taste for life when you are just absolutely ecstatic about being in the moment. The yeah. push up, the not the end game, right? Anything. Like, that's gonna be cool to be a seal, but it's like, all right, you know, when I become a Navy SEAL, it sounds like it ends, right? Well, I think mm-hmm. you're you're onto something right there. It's a catalyst for us in the rest of our lives. You talk about all the time wanting to be the best dad you can for your kids. Uh, you know, I talk about it a lot with wanting to serve others, right, and give them something that they might be missing. You know, Wizard, we talk a lot about providing something for somebody that that they couldn't otherwise get, right? That they can feel fulfilled. Right, right. And then the drive to want to do that better and better and better and refine it and move forward. I mean, that's Andy Stump to the T, man. Cool to uh, listen to that. Right? You can listen to him talk about anything. But, all right, yep. Well, you said before he came on, you, you said, you know, he's going to be one of those guys, and I agreed with you, that when he opens his mouth and says something, it's going to be worth listening to. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> but you know what? Let's let's recap over you know those three main points that he threw out there because yes. I think those are really valuable and spoke to also you know what he covered in the show. The first one was you know sweat, waking up, doing something physical and challenging every day, getting your day started like that. Right, right. Uh, the second was do something that you don't like to do but you know that you need to do every day. It's like your procrastination buster, right, right there, huh? And focus on incremental improvement every day which obviously that was a major inch by thing. inch that's the inch by inch yeah yeah right well i like the i like the con- i'm a big physical physicality guy too when i work with coaching clients or whomever i i generally start with that because if if you can why is a- that why do you start with that well because we're physical creatures when you think at at our core on on what we've done and how we've evolved and you know it's only really in the modern era that we've become so sedentary but you know, the greatest sense of personal gain begins when you can be physically fit enough to feel like you're you're gaining momentum in that area and feel good about yourself. So I always try and start with that physicality. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he's talking about too. You know, where if you can condition yourself to advance your health, you know, in your nutritional health, your your physical health, your strength, your mm-hmm. endurance, that that creates those incremental uh, platforms to step off mental health and emotional health and relationship health. And it's key. I mean, you got to be mm. physical. I mean, Marcus, you talk about it all the time. That's why you go to Exos every year, right? right? Well, he's basically broken down mind, body, and spirit into totally. in, into what his own it works works for him. And that's, man, there's a reason why that's been around forever. And th- you say those together and there's, there's they're important. When all three of those are connected and they're working on the same page and, and, <clears throat> and the and balance. The, yeah, there you go. That like, homeostasis right there. Exactly. That center energy. That allows you to push everything, right? If one of those is missing, then you, you can't, you're, you're walking sideways. You're out of whack for right? sure. So those things, those little prep things he does. And the beautiful part about it is he can tell you what they were. A lot of people don't know what they are. I mean, most people do all that stuff anyways to some kind of degree. They just they don't know it or they're not willing enough to push it real hard. Push it real hard thing. to catch up with the others. Yeah. 
Good point. Good point. Well, I, I think the guy is awesome, man. I'm so stoked. I mean, he's Absolutely. such a yeah, such a great dude. I can't, you know. Hopefully, we'll get him back on here in in a year or two, and so he can expand on on drill down on some more of these leadership ideas that he's really cultivating. I mean, the guy's amazing. All right, it, listen. If you're listening, man, and this is your first show. Boy, did you just get served up a doozy. I mean, this is one of, I mean, just amazing. Uh, if you if you really enjoyed it and you dug it, please help us out by spreading the word, telling your friends about the Team Never Quit podcast. If you want to know more, please visit our site at tnqpodcast.com uh, where you can see a whole slew of other shows. We're also on iTunes. You can download and have us on demand. Literally, if you're driving to work, you're working out, you're just trying to go to sleep. I don't know about that would be a good thing, but get your day started. You know, go to iTunes, download, subscribe to our podcast and share it with other people. If you're coming back, thank you so much. We appreciate your loyalty. We appreciate you being here. We could not do this without you. We could not be having the inspiration if you weren't there supplying us with the feedback that you get, the emails that you send us, the stories that you provide us, your greatest never quit stories. And if you haven't understood how important that is to you and you've got one, go to our website, tnqpodcast.com and write down your greatest never quit story or someone you know and share that with us because what we like to do is we like to read some of those on air and I've got a doozy today gents this is a big one and so let me read this for everybody this is from Brogan I am currently living with a disease so painful it is nicknamed in the medical literature the suicide disease, as there is no cure. This is my never quit story. I have had bilateral trigeminal neuralgia for 15 years now. I was raised by a family of professional athletes where losing was not an option. My father was not raising a daughter, but an athlete. Our daily chores included running and whatever strength training program we were on. The boys played baseball and I played tennis. I ended my career in college when I chose my husband and his Navy career over any future in the sport. I became the best ER nurse I could be working in the busiest ER in the state. I loved the outdoors and turned my passion into triathlons and skiing in the winter. But why does this matter? When I was first diagnosed with TN, I would, you, I would have flare-ups, take time off, and then return to my active life. Over the years, those periods of remission would become less and less. The pain would come out of nowhere, like a lancing blade of lightning striking the nerves in my face, like the hand of God smacking you down. There is no way to tell when it's coming. But like an exposed nerve being electrocuted, you are at its mercy. I have had two craniotomies or brain surgeries to try and help with my symptoms, but the surgeries have just caused more painful side effects. I now have anesthesia dolorosa, described as the hornet's nest in your face. It feels like being burned by a blowtorch and having acid poured on the right side of my, my face simultaneously. There is no cure or known treatment. I can no longer work or run or ski or simply be me. I have gone through an entire identity crisis. I had to surrender myself to God because everything I was, an ER nurse, an athlete, an active involved parent, a beautiful loving wife, it was all gone. I had to find out who I was living in this chronic pain. My incredible husband was a corpsman is a big city firefighter paramedic and now has a patient for a wife. We used to be that couple everybody envies. He was my partner, my lover, and now my caretaker. He is the most loving man I could have ever imagined and God gave him to me. He says the same thing about me, but I think he got the shit end of the deal. 
We are raising our daughters with me living in a bubble because anything else sets off pain. Every day is my never quit. Finding you and Marcus's podcast has helped change my mindset to get me in a healthy place and push my physical limits. I can never thank you enough for that. Well, Brogan, thank you for taking the time to write into us. I think your message really hits home in ways that you can't imagine. There are so many people out there living with pain, physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain. And your message will inspire them too, to fight on, to forge their never quit mindset so they too can stay in the fight. Thank you for writing in. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I was, I was in LA the other day. Because somebody was asking me a question. They were like, hey, are warriors uh, born or are they made? And man, I didn't know the answer. So I was like, hey, I, don't, I, don't have, I had never thought about it too much. And I think sometimes the whole description of a warrior obviously comes down from us, where the we swing the axes and, and whatnot. And I was thinking about it, I was like, man, I think you're born one. And then life kind of whittles you into the how, how extensive you are at it. Right. But each, each, each and everybody falls into a battle, a war, unto themselves. And it doesn't matter if we're fighting an enemy or if you're a warrior for religion or for law or for peace, humanity, and medicine. I mean, if you get stuck in a fight with something on the inside of you, that's the toughest one of all, man. When, when you've got something going on on the inside, you can't, and, and, and we can't figure it out. And that's, that's another blessing to have other humans around, right? Somebody to help you get through all that and look for, a, for an answer. But in situations like that, man, that's one of the deals. It's, uh, if you've got something on the inside you're fighting with, man, you, you're the one that has to fight the hardest. Never forget that. And, and the one thing that can't happen to you, man, is you can't be beaten mentally. Okay, okay, they can't get in there, they can't touch your brain, they can't change the outcome. Always hold on to that and think about it the way we do. If in order to beat you mentally, they gotta beat everybody around you. That's why you surround yourself with good people. And and that's almost impossible to do. I would say it is impossible. And no, you know, no matter how dark the pit, man, no matter how far the fall, always start climbing back up. Just always climb back up. And you're doing that. So, man, my hat's off to you. God bless you. I wanna thank God. And I want to thank Christ, and I want to thank my girls, and I want to thank my family. I want to thank Broken. I want to thank Andy for his contribution today. I want to thank you, Wizard, and Marcus, for allowing me to live out my purpose in life and to go inch by inch in this life to try and do what I know I need to do, which is serve other people with positivity and love. So that's what I want to be thankful for. Marcus? everybody for bringing us back on the uh, microphone amen helping us reach people that like this who uh who write in and tell about their struggles with everybody else and kind of let you know man we're all in this together no matter uh what kind of fight it is so uh thanks for that i, I truly man i wake up every day and can't believe it that's a tr no true statement thank y'all for that i'm out i'm out Never quit. Team Never Quit Radio.